Hi, good morning, Largo. Thank you so much for joining us this morning for our sustainability series. My name is Laura Thomas. I'm the sustainability program administrator for the city of Largo. And I'm really happy to be here with you all this morning and to help learn about a really important topic for our community. So we encourage you to ask questions throughout the presentation, engage in and let us know what you're thinking and, and what you want to know about throughout the morning with us. Um, so today we're going to be talking about healthy waterways and we are lucky to have Chris Benini, our stormwater program administrator with us today to talk about stormwater pollution, toxic algae and other conditions that can cause public health and environmental issues. And you're encouraged to go to ourfuturelargo.com to learn more about this topic after the presentation. Um, but with that, we're going to go ahead and kick it off to Chris Benini. So welcome, Chris. Thanks for being with us this morning. Hi, Laura. Thank you very much. Glad to be here. Hi, everybody else. And I guess if we are ready to go, Laura, is there anything else you'd like to cover? No, I think at this point, uh, you're welcome to kick it off and then we'll answer questions together uh, at the end of our at the end of your presentation this morning. So thanks so much, Chris. Great. Well, everybody, I'm going to start sharing my screen here. So bear with me as I get the slideshow started. And I believe, uh, Floor, you could give me an audio uh, confirmation that I have my slideshow showing on the screen. Looks great, Chris. Thank you. Well, hello, everybody. Thank you for starting off your Saturday morning uh, talking with us. And uh, as Laura said, uh, at the end of this, uh, we're going to have a Q&A session. But um, just wanted to go through a quick couple things to begin with, just talk about today's agenda. I'll introduce myself in a second, but uh, just to kind of give you an idea of what to expect. Um, I'll talk about myself a little bit and um, we're gonna shoot straight to it. We're talking about healthy waterways and no clickbait here, no waiting. We're just gonna start off with what is a healthy waterway? Um, talk about what makes a healthy waterway and what prevents a healthy waterway from happening. And, going through uh, Largo's history and Pinellas County history a little bit and talk about human development and how we've progressed over the last century and how that's impacted our stormwater and our waterways throughout the county and um, taking us to present day where the city of Largo, what do we do now? Well, as a municipality, we have a lot of responsibilities and uh, what is the city doing to keep your waterway, our waterway clean and clear and healthy and um, and then on the flip side, I'm going to turn it over to everybody else, everybody who's watching now and possibly in the future. What can we all do to help manage runoff and help keep our water clean for future years and for future generations? And as Laura said, at the very end, I'll stick around. Um, Laura will stick around and we'll be able to do a Q&A. So uh, looking forward to it. And um, please use the chat box. We really utilize it and it's going to be great. So a little bit about me. I'm Chris Beanie. I am the City of Largo Stormwater Project, uh, sorry, Stormwater Program uh, Administrator. Uh, and a lot of the times over the years, you've heard things like only rain down the drain, you know, report dumping, report, you know, if you see anything suspicious, don't blow your grass into the roadways. Um, those calls go to me. So, hey world, if you've called, thank you. We always depend on our eyes and ears around Largo to help us monitor what's going on because we just don't have enough staff to watch every single pond, every single ditch to see when suspicious dumping happens or discharges or breaks in lines that are, you know, wastewater lines or that sort of stuff. So please, if you have a moment right now, write down the number or uh, you know, Largo.com has plenty of links to it too, email me. I am here and I work very hard to try to monitor what goes in, on out in the field. Um, so our day-to-day -day lives here in, in Largo, it's the engineering services department, the environmental services department, our public works departments, we're all watching the environment, trying to prevent dumping and uh, pollution getting into our waterways, but we really, really depend on you guys um, 
notifying us when something does happen. So uh, take a moment, feel free to write it down. And um, so that's me and that's who I am. And most of the time my life deals with stormwater, you know, looking at it, touching it, testing it and dealing with face-to-face. -face. So Laura gave me the opportunity to take, present more of a big picture um, thought of uh, stormwaters and healthy waterways. Uh, so this is a great opportunity for me to actually take a step back, think about what I do, think about what we do in Largo and uh, kind of give a big picture, which is something I'm not used to it and something I'm really excited about. So um, if I start waving my hands, guys, that's because I'm excited. And um, it's just a way that it really is fun for me to uh, get to talk to you guys. Um, so he you was know, just talking about a bunch of different things that happen. We try to watch for in Largo, but what does impact a waterway? I'm mean, going to start with the bad first, and then we're going to you know, flip the switch and talk to the good. But as we are thinking about our ponds, our creeks, our ditches, our canals, our intercoastal waterways, Tampa Bay, what, what actually hurts it? Uh, and in a basic level, we all you know, know if you flick that cigarette butt out your car window as you're driving on the road, uh, you, that's generally bad. Um, but there's a lot more and it happens on a very small scale in a lot of different instances. And all these things add up over time. So stormwater is the number one source of pollution in our waterways. It's uh, a lot of times in the media, we talk about big factories and you know, power companies and uh, you know, industrial suppliers that are producing and manufacturing things that um, the FDEP and the EPA on a state and federal level have done a really good job monitoring and taking those pollution sources ever since the uh, 60s to present day and really helping control their pollution sources. So they used to be uh, the, the largest source of pollution, but now they've actually been able to shrink their footprint on our waterways so that actually our runoff, the, the non-point sources, stuff like, you know, uh, us in our cars, us maintaining our lawns and us releasing all these different things uh, in the environment, we are the number one source, us, the people and our, our human activity. So the top four uh, heavy hitters, sediment, it's kind of natural processes, but as uh, our storm drains drain into the ditches, as bacteria, um, is included in our, our pay, uh, excuse me, pet waste and um, this kind of uh, fats, oils, and grease. You've seen all the posters around Largo that say, okay, fogs, fats, oils, and greases, we need to, you know, get these disposed of properly and correctly. Um, and all these things add up. Um, nutrients is a big one too, which uh, if you've been Online, if you've looked at Pinellas County website, Largo's website, nutrients is related to fertilizers. Um, the, the four major nutrients that are infecting our waterways right now are nitrogen, uh, phosphorus, calcium, and potassium. Those are kind of the four major ingredients in our fertilizers that um, it's great. It's healthy for our plants and our gardens. Uh, unfortunately, we live in a very rainy state and so every time it rains, a lot of those fertilizers, uh, quick release, long release, doesn't matter. If the rain can wash it away, it will get into our creeks and our ditches and our ponds and our intercoastal waterways. And um, that excess of nutrients, it, it helps algae grow. So algae eats the same nutrients as their flower bed and uh, our trees and our grass. And uh, we've, I'll we'll we'll get into algae here in a little bit and harmful algal blooms, but um, we'll just kind of push forward to generally this is bad for our own waterways. Um, and kind of going down the list to the end, trace metals, um, that's a lot of what has to do with our cars. As we're driving, uh, rubbers from our tires, our exhausts, the petroleum products that are, are burned as we're driving that's released uh, uh, every single minute that we're driving and that will get into our catch basins which you see on the right that's a graded inlet and that's you can see that oily sheen it's that rainbow color on the water that's uh it's a petroleum product and it's getting into a an inlet right there and we'll uh, 
cover that in a little bit about where that goes to, but and that, that goes directly into a JIT system, into a creek. So um, the last one on the list, pesticides. The number one thing with pesticides, we, we, we like to use them, right? We don't like our mosquitoes. We don't like bugs in our household, all that sort of stuff. Um, if we use them in excess, and if they get released into the environment and they get down to the creeks, it's going to be killing microorganisms that are integral and important in our waterways. So uh, that's, that's something where I go back to what I said a couple seconds ago, we are in a very rainy state. And when we release chemicals into our houses, outside of our houses, in our cars, outside of our cars, and it gets released in the environment, it will get into the waterways where they're not designed to be there. And so it can be very destructive to local ecosystems. So this is bad. Let's start off with the bad, but let's get to some good stuff. Um, what is a healthy waterway? Because we do have a lot of wonderful, we have a lot of great healthy waterways. And ever since the 1970s, even Tampa Bay as a whole, we have improved the quality of water all around us. So to put it in the most simple way possible, a healthy waterway is a waterway that can support all of the competing needs that occur in the ecosystem. Think about the plants that are in the water. Think of the wildlife that is in the water or drinks the water. Um, microorganisms that live in, out, around the water. And even humans, we like to swim in the water. We like to take our pets and walk along the water, in the water, enjoy it. And um, when we talk about supporting all the competing needs, I all these different uses. It's one body of water. Imagine this, uh, the New Haven Lake, Lake right there. Um, that's uh, on the north side of Almerton uh, near Lake Avenue in Largo. And it has had a storied past of, you know, times where it's overgrown with uh, hydrilla and water hyacinth and water lettuce. And um, it's something where it bounces back after we do some aquatic treatment and maintenance to it. And it's a wonderful thing to see. You have many fish in there. You have plant life. You have people walking with their pets, enjoying it, enjoying nature. And all these different uses happening simultaneously around one body of water. And it's something that saying, OK, the waterway is healthy. Um, I can talk to you about the chemistry of it, but I think that a lot of you are going to log off and uh, ignore it because it's really boring sometimes. So it's really when it boils down to is that there's a balance and there's an equal sharing of the resource that uh, everybody can be healthy, the fish can be healthy, the plants can be healthy. And I'd love to hear your opinions. Um, go to that chat box. What are some of the characteristics that you would include in a healthy waterway? You know, birds? If there's a lot of birds, if there's a lot of fish, if, if you can uh, go fishing in there continuously without having to restock every season, uh, let us know. What do you think is a healthy waterway? So the next part of the, the, the slideshow we're going to do here is a little bit of a history. And I went into old um, ortho imagery archives that Pinellas County has. It's really cool. If you guys see that long link down at the bottom, the next four slides are all going to have the same link. Uh, check it out. It has imagery of an, the entire Pinellas County over the last, ever since 1926. So we're, we're approaching 100 years of pictures um, to watch development throughout all of the uh, Pinellas County area. And I'm not sure if you guys can see my mouse or not, but kind of almost dead center, a little bit above dead center in the map is Almerton. And that line going at a 45 degree angle to the northwest from the southeast is an old railroad line. And this is 1926. And you can see just a lot of ponds and a lot of open, wide open area where those, those are old fields, trees, orange groves. Um, the circles, you, you probably can guess that those are ponds. Um, the the Olmerton through it's one of our oldest roads but um kind of on the left side of the screen that's uh, Lake Seminole in its early years with farmland around it and you know Pinellas County historically it's a lot of oranges uh, on a lot of farmland uh, cattle even and um, 
So just we'll move fast forward about 25, yeah, exactly 25 years later, almost in the same area. Uh, we can see a little bit closer on the very left hand side of the, of the picture is Lake Seminole, or I'm sorry, Taylor Lake. Taylor Lake is a bit north of Lake Seminole and Taylor Lake is uh, nested on 8th Avenue southwest in Largo. Um, there's the Pinecrest Golf Club there if any of everybody has ever been there. Um, but you can kind of see on the east side, east of the, the very middle north and south road is Seminole Boulevard. You can kind of see there's a lot of farmland still in this area, but you can kind of see a lot of people are developing on the western side of it. And that's kind of our, our higher altitude uh, part of the, of the county. And it's where Largo downtown is uh, in the very northwestern part of the picture. So we can kind of see human development happening. And I'm going to continue our, our very quick uh, trip through history. But 1975, this is zoomed in a little bit more. Um, but what you can see is Largo 1975 near Taylor Lake, what we were just looking at. It's a lot more detailed here, but you can see um, Seminole Boulevard is on the right hand corner going north and south. And then you have those railroad tracks in the very upper right hand corner of the screen. But we have the uh, Palm Hill um, Country Club dead center. And you have two tanks right in the middle of it. No, it's actually the Pinellas County. Uh, it's one of the oldest uh, drinking water uh, treatment stations in the county. And you can just kind of see to the east of those two giant tanks where, where they were making drinking water back in the 70s. That's a orange grove. And you can kind of see there's a lot of dirt. There's a lot of trees. It's kind of organized real close to the tanks. But uh, it, it's just kind of a natural landscape towards the eastern side. And that's 1975, so I'm gonna flip one more to the right. We can see those two tanks again. That's, uh, what, 23 years later. And we have a brand new uh, manufactured home area, no more orange grove, it's gone. And um, if you're familiar, uh, the, the road on the very western side of the picture is Seminole on the south side, that's Ulmerton. And voila, we have uh, Largo Mall on the very bottom right hand side of the screen, that's, that's Largo Mall. Uh, and the Lowe's over on like Seminole, all this development happening. I, I kind of, I'm taking you through this very rapid succession in 25 year increments just to see how much we've regressed. Pinellas County has grown a lot, a lot. And, and, and the major takeaway from this is that we took this old landscape that was farmland, trees, you know, wild forests, fields, creeks, ponds, ditches, and we turned it into our own uses and we'll brings up a question, at least for me, well, it's my job, uh, but what do we do with the stormwater? What happens to all that water that used to drop on a field of trees into a forest that could really soak it up? Every time that it rains, um, we have this concept in stormwater where we ask, is that rain falling on a pervious surface or an impervious surface? And just the the real basic of it is impervious surfaces. Think of your roof or think of your driveway or think of the road in front of your house. The, the it's impervious. The water's not going to be able to drain through it. And if the water doesn't drain through it while it's raining, and you know, it has to go somewhere. So maybe half of your property that you live on is you know, all those impervious surfaces. Maybe it's 50%. So in the case, maybe we have a storm that drops an inch of rain. Well, your, your field before your house was there had an inch of rain going to all these pervious surfaces, the grass, the trees, the dirt, the sandy soils, the, all these plants that would readily kind of soak up that inch of rain. Uh, well, half of it's gone. So th that impervious surface, it runs off. So that's what we call stormwater runoff on all these impervious surfaces. Then all of a sudden, you have a half the amount 
of pervious area. So that means that that pervious area has two inches of rain to deal with during that one inch rainstorm. So it's kind of a very, very basic building block. When you're talking about stormwater drainage and you're talking about how much rain is falling, it really boils down to where, how much does it fall? Where does it go? And how can we store it? How can we help it absorb into the soil so that it waters the grass, it replenishes our aquifers, it kind of does what nature always intended to do, but we design it in a way that we have to take it off of our impervious surfaces in an efficient manner. Um, so the other, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to flip to another bad thing. So we're, you know, bad, good, bad, good. Um, so here's the bad. Um, all of this human development, you know, from 1972 to, to the 1970s, all this human development, we, we really weren't thinking that much about removing nutrients from the water. We weren't thinking intensely about, okay, well, we keep our waterways clean. Well, you know, we didn't have a scientific understanding widespread and, and, and adapted by uh, whether it be cities or states or the nation as a whole, how to keep our waterways clean. And the impact to Tampa Bay was um, blue green algae. We had an excess of nutrients and bacteria going into Tampa Bay. If, if any of you watching right now were around the Tampa Bay area in the 60s and 70s and 80s, this, this scene right here, this is on the east side of Tampa Bay, Hells Row Bay near Gibsonton, uh, that's a very familiar thing. And that is a lot of algae. And, uh, and algae really dominates an ecosystem because it's, it's the weed of the water. It, it thrives, it grows quickly and it blocks out the sunlight uh, from everything around it. Um, and what happens when you have an excess of algae is it's a very quick life cycle. That algae grows, it, it blooms, it blooms, it blooms, it creates a ton of biomass to the point where it actually outgrows the capacity of the environment and then it dies. And once all that biomass uh, dies, it eventually sinks down to the bottom and starts to decompose. And, uh, and then we have very happy bacteria uh, that is readily, it's gobbling it all up and that's an aerobic cycle. So you, know, you think of green algae, you think, okay, well, it's creating a lot of oxygen. It's a quick little spurt of creating oxygen, but unfortunately once it dies in its life cycle, it goes to the bottom and we have a very long lasting um, aerobic uh, process of breaking down uh, all of these uh, biomaterials so that it actually strips the oxygen and water in the water and um, to the point where all of Tampa Bay was caused, called a dead zone. We really didn't have a good ecosystem for but in several decades because we had so much, uh, it's called eutrophication, um, that, that cycle of uh, excess growth of biomaterial and going down at the bottom and you have bacteria decomposing it and uh, basically stripping the, the water of any oxygen so you can't really have normal uh, fish life, plant life uh, growing in it. So it was uh, effectively a dead, dead zone for many years until we started to you know, mitigate it and we started regulating and taking away a lot of the sources for in nutrients, all that nitrogen, potassium, phosphorus, calcium, um, to the point where we've rebounded. Tampa Bay, you know, current day, it's healthy. We have fish, we have fishing people, we have a lot of ecotourism, we have a lot of stuff going on. So ultimately one of the important things is waterways in our food. So as we, look from the past, we look to the present, we've progressed so far from the 1970s when the Tampa Bay, the entire, the entirety of Tampa Bay is a dead zone, we are now thriving and we can actually use these waterways for, it's our food, it's our, our tourism. Um, Pinellas County, we're surrounded, we, well, not quite surrounded, almost surrounded. We have the east, west and south borders on the water. We have a thriving fishing industry now. Uh, we have a lot of recreational fishing. And it also on the south side of Tampa Bay, we have a lot of shellfish harvesting. And um, yeah, if, if any of you are boaters out there, you might have been clamming or you might have gone to the Tarpon Springs area or different different spots to actually, you know, find shellfish. It's 
a great part of living in Florida and protecting our waterways and preventing those dead zones from happening or preventing algal blooms. Uh, that's so vital to let all this human activity happen. Um, I'm going to rewind just two years uh, back in 2018, 2017, 2018. Remember all those headlines about uh, red tide? Well, uh, it's, it's a different type of algal bloom from blue green algae uh, because red tide often has uh, toxins in it. There's certain types of algae that create harmful toxins that uh, when fish eat that algae, it bioaccumulates and that fish is no longer edible by humans because humans, if we do eat enough of that uh, toxic material, it can hurt if it not kill humans too. And it goes up the entire food chain. So um, as we're thinking about well, healthy waterways and all that balance that I talked about earlier, an equal use between all the different, whether it be the wildlife or pets, us, the bacteria, the plants, if there's a balance and it's all being shared and used properly, we wouldn't see harmful algal blooms. We won't see that blue green algae. So our goal is to avoid that. And so we can actually use the waterways to our benefit. And, and, and so it's going to be a long lasting thing. Uh, and then this is another thing too. We, we depend on it in Florida. We're a tourism state. Uh, we have seafood, uh, that people love to come and eat. We have clean beaches that people love to come and walk on. And then we have just folks who love hopping on a kayak, going through the Whedon uh, Island Nature Preserve or, or you know, hopping in a tour boat off of Tarpon Springs, get a look at the sponges uh, up off of uh, Anclote Isle. So as this all happens and you know we looked at the history, I'm gonna do one quick little plug um, because as we are here and as we've developed Pinellas County and we've made it our own, we still do have certain things we don't really have control over and that's hurricanes. Um, so once again, if you've been on Pinellas County's website, if you've looked at local ads, this is all over the place. It's called Know Your Zone. Uh, Pinellas County has done a great job of helping us realize where the highest risks area, risk areas are in, the, in, in Pinellas County. Largo, we have a lot of high lying areas that we, we might not be at high risk for flooding, but um, low lying areas, all those red spots on the map, uh, east of Eagle Lake Park, uh, east of 19, near the Clearwater, uh, St. Pete Clearwater Airport, and especially along the intercoastal waterway over on the west side, these are very high risk areas. If we have a tropical storm coming or a hurricane heading our way, um, please check it out. Know your zone. This is a, the most important uh, to protect yourself. But uh, there's another lesson here too. These are the areas where we might be flooding out during a hurricane, but also we interact with our waterways a lot. Um, you know, across the entirety of Largo, our stormwater does drain into other areas. I'll go over that in a second. But if you're living in these low-lying areas, you're, you're, the water health will impact you as much as if you litter, if you dump, it's going straight into the water and it's going to be sitting right next to where you live. So keep that in mind. Um, so covered the second bullet point of our, our outline. So that's our little short history and looking at our, our community and the changes that we've made. Uh, well, but what does Largo do? So now that we're here, now that it's 2020, you know, okay, we, we've learned all these lessons. What What's our structure? What do we do as a municipality to, to try to talk about, you know, human safety? You know, as we are preparing for storms, there's human safety, there's property safety, there's protecting the environment. Those are kind of our three major themes that we're always trying to do as a stormwater program. Um, so in Largo, we have three major teams that all deal with stormwater. Um, engineering services, that's where I work. Um, uh, we deal with the planning, the design, and you know, kind of taking the big picture approach to, okay, if we have a city, where do we put the pipes? Where do we do the drainage? Where do we build the ponds? Um, and then how do we require 
uh, folks to build an apartment complex or to build a house. You know, can you put that fence there? Is it going to block stormwater drainage? Uh, it's a daily thing. We do it five days a week, and it's a um, in a very persistent process so that we can have a city and we can interact with nature in a, in a safe and clean way. And, and lastly, the third bullet point is environmental compliance. Um, when people do break the rules, when people do build without a permit and break, you know, all of our protocols, I'll be knocking on your door. You have to follow the rules and environmental compliance is very important because if we don't uh, enforce the rules and somebody's just dumping paint down the drain, it, it throws that whole balance of our healthy waterways out of whack. And it just, we can't allow it because of that balance. We wanna keep our waterways healthy and safe. Um, second team, public works. Those are, that's our operation and maintenance crews. Those are the guys that are cutting the grass in the ditches on top of the ditches. They're the ones that when a hurricane does happen, they are clearing out the path for flow so that when water does come, it's not gonna flood an entire neighborhood out. Um, those are the ones that are in their vehicles, they're in their rain jackets, shoveling muck from pipes or inlets, all that sort of stuff. They, those are the folks that are actually making it happen. Um, and, and lastly, community development, it's tied in with environmental compliance, but uh, it, as we're building and as we're changing as a community, it's uh, an enforcement aspect. Uh, I kind of tap on the letter A, but also outreach. Um, you know, what we're doing here today, uh, we're nothing without our residents. I, I wouldn't have a job if it weren't for all of you people who, all of us people, I should say, <laughs> who live in Largo and, and, and use services and use the environment and use the waterways and enjoy it to, to the fullest extent. Um, we, we have to teach each other, teach each other to treat it with respect, treat it in a way that's clean and healthy, that, uh, not only us and our neighbors can enjoy it, but our future generations. Um, so that's our, our team. Um, so I talked about pipes and ditches and ponds uh, at least twice now. And, and this is my day-to-day -day, um, nightmare is walking through a, a pipe. Oh, wait, I'm gonna, I'm gonna do a timeout real quick because I didn't explain something right here. We have a picture of an alligator. Um, this happened a few years ago. I, it's our theme. We we developed in wild land. We had ditches and ponds that we filled in or piped in, uh, and the alligators were there first. So every once in a while, they like to use our pipe system, and they get into our stormwater pipes. Uh, they really don't care about our environmental compliance teams. They're just going to go where they want to go. So um, yeah, this was a, an incident where we were cleaning out a pipe, and well, we stumbled across a. a a fairly large alligator. I don't know how big it was, but um, we had to call uh, Fish and Wildlife to uh, help remove the alligator and uh, take him or her to a uh, safer environment. Um, but this picture, uh, this is most certainly not Largo. This is a picture, I believe it's, I'm, my guess is New York City, uh, somewhere up north in the olden days. A lot of times when we think about stormwater and where it goes, we depend on media. We, we've all watched shows where we have old detectives and sleuthing in the, the sewers of New York City, or maybe if you're younger, the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles are living in the sewers and there are these giant pipes with tons of space and all those storm inlets on the side of the road, they drain in there, our toilets drain into there. Well, that's, that's called a combined uh, sewer and that's that's olden times that's old cities with massive um, pipe systems that um, can handle both stormwater and wastewater together but we don't have that in Florida actually we have something called uh, municipal separate storm sewer system it's a mouthful so municipal is the M separate storm sewer system that's four of them MS4 so that's where we get that lovely word from uh, and what's it for it's it's a way that we convey water away from a property that we want to protect, properties that are you know, at risk, whether it be our roads or whether it be your house or where you work, uh, we, we channel that water away as quickly as possible because we do have a little mistake with storms. And um, so just to kind of give you a picture 
of a, a, a separate storm sewer system. This is very quickly in a nutshell. Municipal separate storm sewer systems are two pipe systems. We have where our toilets, our showers, our sinks, all that goes into the orange, goldenish color pipe system. Um, and then we have the blue. It's the uh, our storm sewer system. They, they go to do two different locations. Um, in Largo, all those blue pipes go to ditches. They go to lakes and ponds, out to nature, whereas our sanitary sewer system, uh, depending on where you live in Largo, if you're in the Largo sewer district, then it goes to 49th Street, where we have a very large um, uh, uh, sewage treatment facility. Um, so those blue pipes, this is this is a picture. This is, you know, if, if, I'd love to, I could spend five hours looking at this map with you guys today, but um, if you live in a specific watershed, that watershed means that your water, everything in these different areas drain to a specific point. And the arrows kind of help guide us along here. But um, if you live in the middle of Largo, like Largo Mall, you know, the, where that big LARGO Largo is and Largo Mall a little bit to the south of it, all that stuff goes, um, it's called the Long Bayou Watershed. It either goes to Lake Seminole or the Lake Seminole Bypass Canal and ends up in uh, the Boca Ciega Bay. And goes, so that goes south. If you live to the west of there, uh, it's the Walsingham Reservoir drains into McKay Creek. Church Creek drains to the very end of McKay Creek. All that water heads to the west to the southern part of Clearwater Harbor. Um, if you, the northwestern part of Largo that does uh, intersect with uh, Bel Air, the it's called Bel Air Golf Club Run. That also goes to Clearwater Harbor. Um, Allen Creek, Long Branch, uh, Cross Canal, the north portion of it, that all goes to Old Tampa Bay. And um, so that's the destination. Just to kind of give you an idea, if you do uh, go to our future Largo, there is a map there. It's a sustainability map. Um, this is something that's interactive. You can actually go to the website, click on it, uh, and uh, it'll show you a little bit of some facts about each watershed. And you can go to the county's website where they have a little more detailed uh, uh, report on every single one of the watersheds. Um, so if you're curious about one of these areas, feel free in the chat below, say, hey, you know, I have a, you know, where, where does my you know, neighborhood drain to? What, what's, are there issues and all sort of stuff? Feel free, you know, what do you think? Um, is this map useful? Give us a, Share a little bit with us in the chat below. Um, so I'm going to go back to the theme that we keep on talking about is human development. Uh, we do have potential issues with human development. Uh, I'm sure if you're here on the sustainability series, you might be aware of that. Uh, just one quick glimpse into one potential issue. As we have developers, uh, construction jobs, we, we try to prevent pollution and runoff. And this is all this sand and soil we call sediment. Um, it, we prevent, we want to prevent that from getting to the waterways because as it stands, uh, erosion happening in mass all at the same time from a, a, a like a job site or just as something that had a big washout, um, it'll create turbid water. If you look at the bottom right picture, that is a very unhealthy little pond that's right next to some, it looks like other pepper trees or mangroves, but next to a larger water body. That can clog fish gills. It can suffocate plant life. It can kill healthy bacteria that was interacting with the water. It disrupts the entire ecosystem. And if that's left as it is, or if it happens repetitively, you can have entire fish populations killed. Done. That's uh, what we call them a fish kill. And it involves a very smelly, nasty cleanup. And we, you know, not to complain about the work, it's worse for the fish than to be the person cleaning it up. But it's just, we don't want that kind of environmental harm to happen. So that's part of one of the regulations that we do in the city of Largo. Um, so just to kind of, the last part of, you know, what's the city of Largo doing? And also these are just kind of common questions that I get at my job. Uh, this is the intersection of, well, what is Largo doing, but also what are, what are we asking our people to do? What are we asking our residents or our businesses to do um, to help keep clean waterways? Um, and so people ask me all the time, oh, what's so bad about pool water? When, I'm, when I need to drain my pool, we had too much rain, I got to drain the pool. What's so bad about that? Uh, 
every every you know is a very famous children book ch children's uh, little short stories like everybody poops well, so do our pets um and you know, well we don't have our dogs go into our bathrooms um so a lot of times they go out in nature and a lot of folks do not clean up after their dogs but so they ask me oh what's the big deal um number three why am i not allowed to blow my grass into the street uh and number four what's the big deal you know with cars leaking oil everybody does it why you know why are you bugging me this is i get asked these questions on a weekly basis so let's let's go after them one at a time and first one pool water it's against our code of ordinances well, but but why why is pool water bad for the environment it, the reason is the chlorine um, when we're talking about that balance of a healthy waterway when we want to have microorganisms living that are going to be the fish food that the fish eat and then the fish grow and then bigger fish eat the little fish and then we eat the big fish that whole life cycle is disrupted that that food chain is destroyed if we were to contaminate an entire creek with chlorine um, so chlorine will harm the environment it will kill what it comes in contact with that's why we put it in our pools so when if and when you do drain your pool the first thing you do is dechlorinate it. There's little tablets, little chemical, you know, things. Pool, the pool companies, they know about it, they can do it. And then you never, ever drain it directly into the storm drain. You drain it into your yard because it's, A, it's, it's watering your grass, and B, it's also percolating to the ground, which is, you know, instead of going to a storm drain straight out into a creek system, you can replenish uh, the groundwater directly behind your house and uh it's it's much much better for the environment that way um the next one dog excrement when we are walking our dogs and uh, our critters throughout the, the city uh it's you have to pick it up if you're not on your own private property and you do not pick it up you're breaking the code of ordinances uh the reason behind it it's well it's nasty Nobody likes to step, you know, be walking through grass and step on somebody else's uh, dog's excrement. But it's also, you know, all animal poop has bacteria in it. Uh, and, and, and dog feces is unique in a way that it doesn't really break down very quickly. Uh, it's, it could have something to do with the diet or just the way their digestive system works, but we, we feed our dogs artificial food. There's a lot of um, chemicals in it. it. It kind of prevents it from breaking down a lot. And that will wash into our waterways. So we have high nutrient uh, feces with high bacteria content that can, it, every single day, dump trucks full of this goes into Tampa Bay. And we really need to stop um, adding to all the waste that gets into our waterways and, and going back to the balance. The balance here is that we have an excess of nutrient and we have an excess of bacteria that's being released into the waterways, and that's that's food for algae, that's food for algal blooms, and that will throw the life cycle or the the balance in our healthy waterways out of out of whack. Um, very similar to that last one is grass clippings. Um, grass clippings are nutrients that we don't want to release into waterways, but it also it's a nutrient that has fertilizers, pesticides, herbicides. You know, we, we chop it all up in our grass. We kind of forget about it. We walk in it. It doesn't really impact us that much, uh, but it will harm wildlife, whether it be the excess nutrient helping harmful algal blooms or it be the uh, fertilizers uh, contributing to it or whether it be the, uh, the, the pesticides or herbicides actually killing the actual wildlife in our waterways. It's just bad. So please bag your grass, put it in a compost bin, dispose of it we have a very robust solid waste department that they can and do take away our yard waste um, please utilize our city services our our fees are already paying for it so as a, a very useful way to keep our environment clean is just to keep it out of our environment um, and then cars leaking oil i i think it's common knowledge but i'll say it one more time petroleum products paint products Automotive fuels, automotive fuels of any kind. It, if you, you don't want to drink it, the fish don't want to drink it. The birds don't want to drink it. The dogs, the cats, every the raccoons, nobody wants to drink it. 
our petroleum products are not a naturally occurring thing, especially burned petroleum products. Um, it, it's just bad for the environment and it does bioaccumulate and it does get into our food chain. So it's just not healthy all around. So uh, cars leaking oil, if you have a leaky oil car, please get it worked on. If you're parking it somewhere and you have tons of oil spots, uh, put a pan underneath your car. We really just um, um, on a weekly basis need to ask people to please help protect the environment, keep that stuff out of our storm drains. Um, so that's the, uh, the things that we ask our residents to do. And so I'm going to take a step back real quick. And so our pattern is I talk about the bad, then I talk about the good, then I talk about the bad, then I talk about the good. So we're on the good stuff. We're going to finish off um, over the next uh, few minutes here. I think uh, I'm getting close to my, my time where we want to be doing a Q&A. But um, uh, what else can you do? What, what are the, some of the positive things that we can do as a community? And, and, and I'll give you a couple examples of what Largo has done. How can we help, how can we pr be proactive instead of just, if you just follow the rules, yeah, we're doing our basic bare minimums, but we can, can we go above and beyond? Um, there's my, three of my favorite ideas. They're not the entire list. There's a lot of lists out there of things you can do, but what can we do in Florida? I love rain gardens. This is a couple of pictures of our Largo Community Center. If you're ever curious about a very substantial, large uh, stormwater treatment system, go to our community center. I'll call me up. I'll go out there. I'll give you a tour. I love this place. It gives me an excuse to go away from the desk too. Um, rain gardens are a way to collect rainwater and to hold it on site so that a it's it's actually feeding plants, but B, it's it's percolating it under the ground. Like I said earlier, it, it, it holds water to a point that it will go down into the earth and it'll meet up with our uh, shallow aquifers in Florida. And it'll take years, but uh, our groundwater table is constantly rising, lowering, rising, lowering with the, the rain. But if we had more and more of these rain gardens, it would uh, stay replenished uh, more and more. Um, another, another idea that I love is uh, start using a rain barrel or two or three or four. Um, our, our roofs are great storm water collection devices. We have the entire roof already collecting our rainwater and channeling it into a gutter. Uh, we can collect it. We can make a barrel and raise that barrel up off the ground a little bit so that you can, if you see the picture on the right, this is a picture provided by Swiftman, Southwest Florida Modern Management District. Um, but you put a nozzle on the bottom, then you can water your grass for free. Um, if you're using your potable water, you're paying for that water. Why not use free water? Um, and this is just another idea of you keep it on your property. If you have less water running off of your property into the curb, into the street, into the gutter, all those pesticides, fertilizers, all this sort of stuff is going to be released into the environment. Might as well just keep the water here and use it on a dry day. And uh, last uh, idea that I'm going to throw out there for you to be proactive is plant a Florida friendly landscape. University of Florida has started up this program called the Florida friendly landscape program. And if you just Google it, Florida friendly landscape, uh, I'm going to say that as many times as I can. It's a wonderful resource. If you're ever interested in planting local beneficial plants, it's also a great guide for stormwater runoff. They give you ideas on how to, if you if you own land, or if you are renting a property where the property owner likes to plant or, or change things or, you know, change, uh, just basically getting away from grass, by all means, check it out. The Florida Friendly Landscape has great, it's a wealth of knowledge. It's so cool. I love looking at the pictures and there's just this four word phrase that I love to repeat over and over also is right place, right plant, right place. It gives you a guide. It makes it simple. Um, if you're close to water or if you're in a high and dry area, it, it'll guide you through the whole thing. So um, check it out. And uh, planting stuff like this is these are plants that don't need regular fertilizing. They're plants that don't need regular watering or, or even uh, 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 pesticides or herbicides. They are robust. They're Florida friendly. And uh, it's a way to help keep our waterway clean. Um, so on that note, I think I'm over time a couple minutes, but we still have plenty of time for Q&A. And I just want to say thank you, everybody, for listening to me rambling. Thank you for listening to me rant and rave uh, and uh, all the tangents. 
but maybe if we can get Laura back on here, we can start up a q and I really appreciate everybody listening in. Well, Chris, thank you so much. That was um, really wonderful to hear so much great information about stormwater and how it impacts us and how we impact it. Um, we do have some um, great comments um, from uh, the community here and we'll jump into those in just a second. I did want to start with a couple of my own. Um, you know, one thing that you talked about and mentioned was the pet waste and that one always really kind of shocks me. Um, and so First, we'll ask a question out to everyone joining us and listening in. Feel free to take a guess at how at this, but how many pounds of pet waste do you think is left on the ground every day in Pinellas County? So pounds of pet waste in one day in Pinellas County. Share your thoughts with us there. I'll give that out in just a second. But what really kind of resonates with me, I guess, is that, you know, I, I love to go out to the bay. Um, I love to go out to the Gulf and swim. Um, you know, so much of our economy is based on fishing. Um, people love going kayaking. But, uh, you know, if we think about pet waste being runoff, then we're really just going to be swimming with that waste, you know, with us. So, Nobody wants to have to deal with that situation um, where we swim, fish, and play. We want it to be healthy and beautiful. So uh, I appreciate you bringing up that point. It always really sticks with me. Um, but if anyone was guessing, the total number of pounds that Pinellas County estimates of pet waste, uh, we have a guess of 2,000 pounds. I wish it was 2,000 pounds. Um, it's 25,000 in one day, 25,000 pounds. Um, so they've got a lot of information how they got that, that number, but, um, you know, that just goes to show that A, we love our pets, but um, B, we should uh, love taking care of them and, and the environment as well. Um, so Chris, I wanted to ask, um, you mentioned that there have been a lot of improvements since the 60s and 70s um, as far as the quality of our water. What do you think the best or biggest improvement has been in either Tampa Bay or in Largo? Um, and, and how did that happen? I will say, I'm, I'm going to quote some of the old timers that I've, I've, I've sat and listened to for, for uh, years now. But um, in Tampa Bay, uh, across the board, um, we separate pollution sources into point sources and non-point sources. Point sources we talk about are factories, it's our wastewater disposal systems. It's like these big, the monsters, it's the, the big smokestacks that you see uh, off in the horizon. Um, we have, so that's point sources and non-point sources are all the little things. It's our cars, it's our, our, our like is my basically my entire presentation. Those are the non-point sources. So our biggest improvement is the point sources. Um, the most aggressive regulatory actions that have happened since the 60s have been to really lower the amount of nutrients or pollutions or effluent, anything coming from our point sources. So our cement factories, our power stations, all sort of stuff, we have carbon scrubbers where instead of a smokestack going straight up in the air that goes through a series of filters of water screens and uh, different types of uh, uh, I, I'm saying scrubbers it's an industry term it's essentially you have these big boxes basically or, or tubes where you run smoke through and you have water and chemicals spring all up in it so you have a big mix of water and um, I'm forgetting the phrase for it. It's a type of flocculant that's in, and it combines with air particles, but it grabs all the muck and all the soot and grime out of the air. So the water, when it comes out the other side, it's extremely clean in comparison to having a smokestack going straight up into the air. Um, and same with the water at, uh, at disposal too. We just, we keep it on site, we treat it, and we have been doing that. And that's where the biggest strides that have happened in the past ever since the 60s is actually, there was where the heavy hitters back when it was a dead zone. Um, and the, the DEP and the EPA, um, DEP I say, it's the Florida Department of Environmental Protection and the EPA is, we all know the Environmental Protection Agency. Um, they really did a lot to reduce that source of pollution. Um, 
So when now that we're focusing on the non-point sources, the, this is the the major contributor now. It's the tide the it's flipped. So they've cleaned the, the point source uh, pollution so well that uh, now the non-point source pollution is the the number one uh, contributor. Very interesting. Thank you. Um, so now let's go over to some comments from the community um, as they've been watching with us. And um, <clears throat> we've got one comment here um, from Angel Martin saying, let's slow down the fishing. We're losing fish and we need them in the coral reefs, which are also dying in our ocean, especially around here. Do you have any thoughts about fishing and, and how that ties into the um, stormwater uh, program? Uh, I think the way that our stormwater program ties into fishing is healthier water allows fish to reproduce at greater levels. Um, and so if we were to clean up our waterways and if we were to have healthy waterways in mass, we would have more, more areas for fish to spawn. We would have uh, more areas like the, if you ever go into a pond, if you're just looking and you just see it, like it almost looks like a little crater it's on the banks. If you're just walking around, most ponds in Largo, you can actually find them. Um, those little craters, a fish, the mama fish kind of wiggles and creates a little circle and it's her nest. And um, the fish eggs are laid there and they hatch there. And you can tell a very healthy pond apart from a not so healthy pond. Sometimes it has to do with access, but if it's close to, a, a, if it's close to the bay, if it's close to the intercoastal, a pond that's less, even less than an acre, it'll have 50 of these nests uh, during the nesting season. And it's just wonderful to see. Um, so as far as the program goes, I really don't have a say in who fishes. Um, and I, I, I hear you that I, we see a lot of fishermen and a lot of recreational fishing going on. Um, and, and to a certain extent, yes, we want to control it. And the uh, Florida Fish and Wildlife Service does, we control it through our licensing and, and actually having certain fish that are not allowed to be caught and it's catch and release for certain species or certain ages. Um, so I think they're doing a great job in that respect. But what I can tell you is that cleaning up our waterways will have a positive impact so that if we can just have more fish growing, then it can keep up with a lot of recreational fishing. And uh, if you're ever curious, um, the, in New England, there has been some of the most interesting and robust studies about fisheries, just natural fisheries um, for uh, bass populations and carp, and I think a couple other ones um, where they've tracked over the last 50 plus years uh, the fishing population where they had so many commercial fishermen, they killed the population, the population rebounded, and then they killed it off again. And then regulation came in and prevented it. Just you don't harvest fish under a certain age. You don't harvest fish that, you know, look like they're like mama fish that are pregnant, that, that sort of thing. And they, they did it to a point where you want to have a balance where it's the maximal sustainable yield. And it's, it's, I'm saying I'm doing this, it's like a lot of fish, not many fish. And what they've done is it's easy to get down. It's hard to get up. So they prevent overfishing to a certain extent where they've leveled out and they're trying to find and, and, and decrease big dips. They got it to a point where they're, you know, out of balance. And it just kind of goes back to the very beginning of the slideshow is like, what is this balance between use and all the different uses of the waterway? So the fish want to use it, they want to live, they want to procreate, they want to create, you know, millions of little baby fish. But we have fishermen who want to harvest them and it's part of our economy. It is important to allow people to fish, but I, I think there is a balance that um, I think we're, we might still be finding in, in Florida. Great, thank you. Um, really interesting. And, and I had no idea about the nests either. Um, it's definitely something I'm gonna have to keep an eye out on the next time I'm, I'm out and, and taking a uh, hike around the county. Um, <laughs> 
we do have um, just a little bit of time left here. I uh, want to get to a couple more thoughts from um, our viewers here this morning. Uh, Sue Harvey Stevenson provided some great info. Um, she picks up trash weekly in her neighborhood um, and she says it hope she hopes it makes a small difference. Yes, it absolutely yes. does make a difference so thank you for that um you know encouraging others to not have to wait for something uh for cleanup to be organized and doing it on your own i think that's really important so thank you very much sue <clears throat> and and then lastly we have from melanie massessa um some really great comments here about challenging uh how it's challenging to map with lidar especially in this county with pooling water and emergent vegetation um wanting to be more proactive about um feral cat populations <clears throat> so some really great information but this last question um that we'll take from her is will there be a higher priority in the future or is there now to install living shorelines and replace seawalls in Pinellas County? So I don't know if you want to address that at all, and, and I'm certainly happy to jump in um, before we close out, and we just have a little bit of time here. Um, actually, that's a great question, and it is something that uh, Pinellas County uh, has been encouraging that uh, living, oh boy, I'm going to have to look this up and I'll, I'll get back on Facebook later on this week and I'm going to post a link to it, but um, living BMPs essentially in stormwater treatment, seawalls, pipes, ditches that have concrete walls, all this sort of stuff. It, you're right. It's not good for the environment. And there is going to be an emphasis on creating um, natural landscaping, natural um, ecosystem based ways to um, hold back, you know, soil from um, caving in. So seawalls is something where that's a tough one because a seawall is a barrier that goes through so much physical strain. The, the physics behind a seawall is astronomically, uh, it, it's beyond me. They're strong. However, leading up to the seawalls, a lot of tidal areas and a lot of um, ponds that don't have tons of water flowing in them, uh, they can absolutely be replaced with softscapes with um, banks that are vegetated. And um, a lot of what we're doing is uh, going to be focusing on that. So absolutely, it's a great question. And yes, there is going to be, there already is a higher priority in it. And it's just, it'll, it can take decades to get an entire Pinellas, an entire county uh shifted over to it but it is it's happening it is happening right now which is fantastic to see yeah and i'll just follow up um <clears throat> real briefly one um happy to take any last questions so if you have anything else you'd like to ask go ahead and type it into um the comment section below happy to answer it but to follow up to what chris said um yes it's becoming a priority it is a priority you know here in largo we don't have as many seawalls we don't um, have direct um or i should say we have very little property that is a uh you know intercoastal or tampa bay shoreline we do have obviously others with channels and lakes and things like that um, but the county as a whole uh, is really doing a wonderful job of becoming very proactive um, to address the impacts of climate change um, increases in flooding storm surge and and really looking at how vulnerable we are um, because when you think about um, you know, needing seawalls, um, hurricanes and flooding don't care about city jurisdictions. They don't care where one bit begins and the other ends. So unless we plan this out, um, uh, collectively, we won't be able to make the full impact that we need. Because if we put up a seawall, the water's just going to go to our neighbors and have somebody else have to deal with that. Um, so that is a really wonderful question and, and happy to, to help uh, provide hopefully a little bit of information on that. Um, so I see that we don't have any further questions at this moment, but thank you, Chris. I wanted to say uh, wonderful presentation, some really great information and happy to get um, all of your comments while you were watching with us today. So um, thank you, Chris, I appreciate your time and, and we look forward to having you help us improve the health of our waterways moving forward. Thank you, Laura. Thanks for having us or me. <laughs> 
All right, everybody, thank you again for joining us for the Largo Sustainability Series. Don't forget to go to OurFutureLargo.com to learn more about some of our efforts, uh, as well as upcoming Sustainability Series um, presentations, and to find uh, more information about Chris and the stormwater program. There's uh, additional links below in the comments, so be sure to check those out and have a wonderful weekend. Thank you.